North Korea fired one unidentified ballistic missile towards the East Sea on Sunday morning, according to South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff. The latest launch marks the North's fifth missile firing since President Yoon Sung Yeol took office in May. It also comes after the USS Ronald Reagan Carrier Strike Group arrived in the southern port city of Busan on Friday to hold combined drills with the South Korean Navy. To talk about the ramifications of the North's latest provocation, we have joining us in the studio today David Maxwell, a retired U.S. Army Special Forces Colonel and currently a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Colonel, it's great to have you on the show today. And it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Could we first get your thoughts on Sunday's missile launch by North Korea, which also came just ahead of U.S. Uh, Vice President Kamala Harris's visit to Seoul this week? Yes, I think, uh, you know, we, whenever uh, the North fires a missile, uh, we should first ask, you know, what objectives do we think uh, they are trying to achieve? What effects are they trying to achieve? Uh, often the missile test uh, or any test is really to advance the program. It's a military necessity. However, in this case, I think it was a short range missile. Uh, it doesn't appear to be something new, uh, you know, not a very advanced missile. Uh, so we can assess that it's probably intended for messaging. Mm. And of course, uh, the Ronald Reagan uh, is in, in theater now. Uh, the vice president's visit is upcoming. And also, I think that uh, one other thing that impacts is the fact that President Yoon and President Biden did not really address North Korea at the UN General Assembly. Uh, and so this could be um, Kim Jong-un actually trying to want to make sure that he stays in the public eye uh, because he was not recognized uh, significantly at the UN General Assembly. Only President Biden made a passing mention of, uh, of him in, the, uh, in regards to sanctions. So it is likely that he's trying to send a message. And of course, we have to understand uh, that uh, Kim Jong-un really has a three-part strategy political warfare to subvert the South and the Iraq-U.S. alliance, uh, blackmail diplomacy, the use, of, uh, the use of tensions, increased tensions, threats, and provocations to gain political and economic concessions, and of course, a warfighting strategy, the ultimate warfighting strategy. And these three strategies are really mutually, uh, you know, mutually supporting and reinforcing. Uh, and so as they develop their military capabilities and test them, that supports their political warfare and black di blackmail diplomacy. And of course, Kim Jong-un wants sanctions relief. Uh, he wants to be, of course, recognized as a nuclear power. Uh, and so uh, this is probably a demonstration uh, to try to continue to ratchet up tensions uh, to really force South Korea and the United States to make concessions. You mentioned that this could be a message in response to the U.S. carrier strike group arriving in South Korea for joint exercises with the South Korean Navy that started today. The strike group included the nuclear-powered USS Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier, and it's in fact the first joint exercising involving a U.S. aircraft carrier since 2017 here in South Korea. Can you first tell us about the exercise? And you also said that you do feel it is a response. This missile launch is a response to this exercise. Well, I don't know if it's a response. We can only really assess. No one knows what's going on inside Kim Jong-un's mind. So we can really only, you know, look at the history, look at the writings, the, uh, the words from the propaganda and agitation department, and try to make an assessment. So we don't know for sure. Mm. Uh, but this is really important that the Ronald Reagan is here. Uh, because the Yoon and Biden administration seem committed, uh, I believe are committed, to ensuring military readiness. Uh, and it has declined uh, since 2018 when President Trump unilaterally made the decision to cancel then Old Chief Freedom Guardian uh, and really scale back exercises in the vain, misguided attempt uh, to try to uh, you know, provide some kind of security guarantee to Kim Jong-un in return for negotiations. Uh, uh, and and with COVID, of course, that also impacted uh, on our readiness. And so military training declined. And so this training uh, with the, the Ronald Reagan and South Korean uh, naval vessels is very important. Uh, it is imperative that we are able to command uh, the maritime domain if there is a war. Uh, we've got to be able to defend against North Korean submarines, uh, North Korean surface ships, North Korean infiltration of special operations forces uh, through uh, uh, over the over the water. So all of these uh, um, uh, 
uh, types of threats uh, will likely be part of training. Of course, air threats, missile mm. threats, uh, and the like. Uh, so this is very important training, uh, and it's important to demonstrate the strength and resolve of the alliance and that we are ready to deal with North Korea should they attack the South. And like all our exercises, these are defensive exercises uh, designed to deter North Korea's attack of the South. And of course, if Kim Jong-un makes the, the wrong decision, then to be able to defend South Korea and defeat the North Korean People's Army. And meanwhile, this seems only to be the start. The Marine Corps of South Korea and the U.S. have drafted a five-year plan to strengthen joint amphibious landing exercises. And in an interview with a local media outlet, a spokesperson for the U.S. Uh, Marine Corps Forces Korea explained that the five-year plan was uh, built upon the continuing uh, the five-year plan will build upon the continuing limited-scale exercises to ultimately include a multiple large-scale combined amphibious drills. Uh, what are your thoughts on this plan? Uh, I think this is also very important. And, of course, we conduct what is called multi-echelon training, uh, you know, tactical operational strategic training, you know, at the tactical level, uh, squads, platoons, companies, battalions, and then larger-scale uh, brigades and, and divisions. Uh, and so uh, they will conduct many different types of exercises uh, over the course of five years, all uh, building on, on each other to develop capabilities. And then they will have periodic large-scale exercises, some in conjunction with uh, Key Resolve and Full Eagle and Ulchi Freedom Shield and others at other times during the year. So, uh, And it's very important to have a plan uh, because this is really how you manage resources uh, and, and really uh, gain efficiencies in training and to ensure a sustained level of readiness uh, so that there are not the peaks and valleys uh, in, in readiness uh, and that the Marines are prepared to deal with any contingency uh, should it arise. What do you think North Korea will make of these plans? Well, of course, they will denounce them. Uh, they will, uh, uh, their propaganda and agitation department will, uh, uh, will, will find ways to criticize them. I think it's important, though, to understand uh, many people listen to North Korea's rhetoric and say that they fear uh, these exercises and they want them to, to stop. Uh, because they they uh, use their propaganda to say these are offensive and, and are prelude to an attack of the mm. North. That is pure North Korean propaganda. But the North doesn't want them to stop for their security reasons, necessarily. They are not really afraid of the military, per se. Uh, they know these exercises are defensive. Uh, they understand what we are doing. They know very well. Uh, what they're trying to do is to stop training to decrease our readiness and really to create a division in the alliance. And if the U.S. forces cannot train in Korea, we cannot leave our forces here. And so their real objective is to make training so inhospitable uh, and to force the diplomats to try to, uh, you know, to say, well, we'll give up training in return for negotiations to create the conditions where we would have to withdraw our forces. And that's really part of its political warfare strategy, uh, to try to create the conditions uh, to force us to withdraw and then to give them a military advantage with no U.S. forces here. So we really need to keep that in mind and not allow ourselves to be duped by their propaganda and to think that we can make concessions uh, by stopping training and that they will come to the negotiating table and negotiate in good faith or as, an, as a responsible member of the international community. They have no intention of doing that. Now, prior to these developments, North Korea recently passed a new law declaring itself a nuclear weapon state, with the law also enshrining the right to use preemptive uh, nuclear strikes to protect itself. Uh, what did you make of this law? Do you think this is a significant change? Well, I don't think it's a significant change uh, in reality, I think this has always been their intention. I do think it is significant that they publicly announced it. I think it should be clear to everyone that they have no intention to denuclearize. Uh, I think that uh, it is now time uh, for the alliance to really develop a new strategy that looks beyond denuclearization because denuclearization uh, is not going to, to happen by negotiation. Uh, so we've got to be able to cope and contain and manage the situation. Uh, but what North Korea is trying to do is to project itself as a nuclear weapon state and then force uh, the United States into arms control negotiations. And so if we, you know, they really would like to negotiate with the United States just as the Soviet Union did with the United States during the Cold War. 
And of course, what that would do is that would, would allow North Korea to be a nuclear weapon state. It would recognize them, give them legitimacy, uh, and they would make some concessions uh, in return for concessions, uh, but they would not eliminate their nuclear program because arms control de facto uh, means that you're, you're controlling your arms and not denuclearizing. Uh, and it's something that we should not um, uh, be deluded into agreeing to because if we do, if we make any concessions, then Kim Jong-un will assess that his political warfare and blackmail diplomacy strategies are a success. And he will double down and continue to uh, to execute these uh, these activities that he has. And so we really need to be smarter than him mm. and have our own superior political warfare plan. With this uh, change in the law, does it further essentially entrench uh, North Korea's will to keep developing its nuclear weapons, but then also at the same time increase the risk of a nuclear war as well? And with that in mind, uh, there'll be all the more reason to prevent local skirmishes from escalating uh, between the two borders, between South Korea, uh, between uh, North Korea and the US and South Korea. As a retired Special Forces Colonel, what do you think the commanders of the Allied forces have to uh, keep in mind and how should they respond? Well, there's really two parts to your question there. The first one is nuclear deterrence and nuclear deterrence works. Um, we know from Huang Zhongyap in 1997 when he defected uh, that, uh, you know, we asked why has North Korea invested all this money in their military but has never resumed hostilities to achieve their objective to dominate the peninsula. And of course, he said really two reasons. One is uh, that they cannot defeat South Korea as long as the United States is supporting South Korea. And the second, they believe that the United States would use nuclear weapons uh, against the North. And so declaratory policy works. And of course, they have been pursuing nuclear weapons since the 1950s uh, because they want to have that deterrent capability. Um, but what is different now is that uh, they don't want nuclear weapons just for deterrence. You know, that's really what they say publicly. Uh, I believe that they have every intention to use nuclear weapons when they decide to go to war. Uh, bases in Japan are vulnerable. Uh, Pusan is vulnerable. Piantek is vulnerable. Uh, Kunsan, Osan. Uh, most likely chemical weapons will be used in, in, uh, in Osan and Kunsan. Uh, but I believe that they will use nuclear weapons. Why? Because their campaign plan is, is designed uh, and, and is really built on a rapid occupation of South Korea before the South Korean military can mobilize all its reserves and before the United States can reinforce the peninsula. That's really it's, it, the heart of its campaign plan. Now, in terms of escalation, in terms of border skirmishes, in terms of activities at the DMZ, um, I spent three years on the DMZ in the 1980s. Um, and now, of course, South Korean forces defend uh, the entire DMZ. Uh, there have been many hundreds of, of engagements and encounters, uh, both at the DMZ as well as in the West Sea along the northern limit line. Uh, we've seen you know, many clashes with the Crab Wars and, of course, the, the uh, criminal Chonun sinking in, in 2010. But what we, what we have seen is in all of these cases there's never any escalation. Mm. And I think that's a, a tribute to the professional professionalism actually on both sides. Mm. You know, I give credit to both the North Korean People's Army and the Rock Army uh, as well, because while they have exchanged uh, fire, uh, they never let it escalate. And I think that's really important. Um, and, and I don't think that there will be an escalation unless Kim Jong-un directs it. And, and so I'm not as concerned about the forces uh, uh, fighting, actually, mm. because they will, they will uh, defend themselves, they'll exchange fire, but they always halt and they never, they never uh, uh, escalate. It is Kim Jong-un, though, that will use these uh, as a prelude to something else. And of course, what I worry about is we look at something in the DMZ and then something happens in the, in the West Sea. And uh, or the East Sea, uh, or that there will be a missile launch. And we really have to be, um, we can't be narrowly focused on single incidents. We have to look at the big picture mm. and, and try to assess and gauge what Kim Jong-un is doing, and we must be ready. But one thing that we should keep in mind is that Kim Jong-un is unlikely to ever escalate uh, if he faces strength. And that's really key. Um, you know, as Stal or as... Uh, uh, Stalin said, you know, if you 
If you find weakness, you know, probe with a bayonet. If you find mush, you push. If you find steel, you stop. And so it's really imperative that when Kim Jong-un does something, that there is a, a decisive, strong alliance response. Mm. And the first response will be by the South Korean military. Uh, they cannot uh, wait. They cannot hold back. And, of course, North Korea expects that. So as long as there is a decisive response at the time and the place of the engagement, uh, it will not escalate. What will cause escalation is if there is waiting, if they wait too long, or if there is, uh, if, if a target is attacked outside the local area. Mm. That will cause escalation. But wherever the provocation occurs, uh, it's imperative uh, that it be met with strength. And we've seen that over the years. Uh, whenever uh, there is strength, then uh, the, uh, the provocation, the hostilities will cease. There's always a number of ways that are debated over how to deal with North Korea's uh, nuclear threat. And one idea that continues to come up is the idea of South Korea either bringing in nuclear weapons or developing its own. First, what do you think of the idea of the U.S. stationing strategic weapons on the Korean Peninsula? And second, some view that South Korea should initiate its own nuclear weapons program as well. What are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I was here when we had nuclear weapons here. I was here when they when we unilaterally withdrew them in support of uh, the North-South Agreement to denuclearize the peninsula. And we supported denuclearization. And, uh, and so in 1991 and 1992, we withdrew uh, our tactical nuclear weapons. Um, I think it's important to understand the U.S. policy. Uh, if we return tactical nuclear weapons here, we would not announce it. Uh, it is our policy neither to confirm nor deny mm. the presence of nuclear weapons. We do not announce where, on what ships they might be on, what aircraft, uh, where they're located. So I think that's important to remember. We would have to change our policy if we wanted to station tactical nuclear weapons here and make that public. Now, the second thing is when we had tactical nuclear weapons here, we had some 90 installations around Korea, 90 U.S. military bases. Now we have some six. And so, um, you know, and we never, of course, publicized where they were. But now with so few military bases, um, it would make all of our bases vulnerable to the the opponents of a nuclear presence. Uh, and we would see what is happening at our THAAD base, a purely defensive weapon system to protect South Korea. And we see how the protesters protest that presence there. If we were to bring tactical nuclear weapons here, uh, I think politically it would really cause upheaval in the South because the political opposition would react to that. So that's one. Uh, second is we have to ask what is the efficacy of having tactical nuclear weapons, what targets, how would they be employed? Uh, and, you know, from a military perspective, uh, but uh, would they have an effect on Kim Jong-un? Would they have a deterrence effect on Kim Jong-un? And the same would could be said for South Korea developing nuclear weapons. I fully understand the rationale, the desire to have nuclear weapons. Mm. Uh, I frankly, though, don't think it will have any deterrent effect on, on uh, Kim Jong-un, uh, whether South Korea develops them or not. You know, it is interesting. South Korea is a nuclear power. South Korea has tremendous nuclear capability, 24 nuclear power plants. North Korea has never been able to, to generate electricity even with, with one in any significant way. And, and South Korea, uh, I think, could easily uh, develop nuclear weapons. They have the scientists, the technicians, uh, the technology. You know, if they had fissile material, they could mm. easily develop nuclear weapons. So South Korea is a nuclear power in uh, really in waiting. Uh, and, and would be far superior uh, to North Korea in terms of nuclear capability if they chose to withdraw from the NPT uh, and do that. But I don't think it's necessary. Uh, and frankly, from a military perspective, nuclear weapons are really not necessary on the Korean Peninsula because our conventional capabilities can destroy the entire North Korean People's Army. Sure. Uh, so uh, whether we ha have nuclear weapons or not, I, I don't think it's, it's wise uh, or useful. It's been fascinating to talk to you, T Colonel, today. We are running out of time. Let me just ask you one more and pick up on a point you made earlier. You said we should look beyond denuclearization. What do you mean by that? What I mean is that we're not going to see an end to the nuclear program, to the missile threats, to the military threats, or the human rights abuses and crimes against humanity uh, as long as the Kim family regime is in power. And what we really need to see, uh, and this is this is something that we've we've heard talk about, we'd like to see denuclearization 
prelude to unification. But actually, uh, only when there's a free and unified Korea will we see an end to the nuclear threat and the human rights abuses. So we really need to focus uh, a strategy in the future on three things. One, human rights up front. Two, an information and influence campaign uh, to, to influence the regime elite, the second tier leadership and the population, and then pursue a free and unified Korea, uh, because ultimately it is a united Republic of Korea that is secure, stable, uh, non-nuclear, uh, under a liberal constitutional form of government, you know, with individual liberty, freedom, free market economy, uh, rule of law and human rights for all. That is what we, we are going to see, uh, because Kim Jong-un denies the human rights of the Korean people and prioritizes nuclear weapons uh, in order to stay in power. And so we must pursue a free and unified Korea. Colonel, we're out of time, so we're going to have to leave it there. We've been speaking to retired U.S. Army Special Forces Colonel David Maxwell. Thank you for sp stopping by today. Thank you for having me.